the best interview panel room Sinister Creature Cons we've had so far. So I'm very excited to invite out now a director who, goddamn, I watched these movies like two days ago and I was like, this is glorier than The Evil Dead. Jesus, this is glorier than The Evil Dead. Everybody, please welcome a great guy, an awesome director, fantastic writer, Mr. Adam Green. Welcome, man. You having a good day so far? Yes, it's so great to be in Sacramento. I've never been here before. I've always wanted to come. They've invited me so many times. I was always like in production or shooting. But now we have a writer's strike going on, and I get to be here, which is great. So um, it's been awesome. It's been so awesome. Silver linings. Yes. Um, well, when we talked this morning, I brought up the thing. The first Adam was on my podcast years ago, and it was to help promote Frozen. And you said that this movie has the best story, believe it or not. Um, and. I gotta say that the fact that you guys, like, the premise is terrifying, like every time I'm on a ski lift, my wife knows I hate being on the things to begin with. We just went to the East Coast and did like a ski, uh, like bus, like up a ski lift where you're enclosed in oh, the thing. Oh, a gondola? Yeah. yeah, and it was like, the guy operating, it's like, you picked the shittiest day to do this. Ruff, 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 ruff. I'm like, great, cool, as the thing's like shaking back and forth. Yeah, they treat it like it's a carnival ride. They're like, I just want to ski, man. So, and that's on an enclosed thing, scared the shit out of me. There's so. a, a Frozen knockoff, uh, a Russian movie called Break, and it's um, Frozen, but they're in a gondola. Yeah. And they had a huge budget. It's all like on a green screen and visual effects and stuff. So go and check that out. I think it's on Amazon Prime, <laughs> but it came out like three years later. And or don't, just watch Adam's work. <laughs> um, but this like, this premise of being stuck on a ski lift is truly terrifying and like imaginably the shittiest experience. Like, is that, what stems this uh, idea to make this movie? Um, so I grew up in Massachusetts, a uh, town called Holliston, which is like 45 minutes outside of Boston. And in middle school, they would do a weekend ski trip for like six weeks. And the mountain that we skied at was called Wachusett, and they were only open Friday through Sunday, unless it was like Christmas break, because they just didn't really have business during the week. And so it was a Sunday night, and I'm like, I'm just going to do one more run really quick. And for anybody who's ever skied before, you know, when you're on a chairlift, sometimes it just magically stops for a few minutes. And they don't come on like a loudspeaker and explain why or when it's going to start. You just know to wait. And normally it just means somebody fell getting off at the top or getting on at the bottom. And um, I was, honestly, I was only stuck for like two minutes. But in those two minutes, I'm looking, there's nobody in the chairs in front of me. There's nobody behind me. It's Sunday night. And I'm like, they know I'm here, right? Like, <laughs> if this thing doesn't stand, I'm like, could I make it from here? And in New England, you're skiing on basically ice. It's not like, you know, the beautiful ski resorts you have out here where it's all powder and stuff. Like, if, if you were to even jump from 20 feet, you're breaking your legs. And so that was the last time I ever went skiing. And then cut to, I don't know, I guess like 15 years later. Well, wait, it was high school, so it was like three years ago. Um, I was watching the morning news and you know how I'm sure they do the same thing here they'll put up like a still shot of some beautiful scenic thing when they put up the weather report and it was Big Bear Mountain and it was just the empty chair of the sitting there and so I remember being stuck and I'm like that would be a good movie that would be a challenge too you got three characters in a chair you don't get costume changes you don't get scene changes like that would be a real challenge um, and then that was sort of it. Um, so we were on the set shooting a movie called Grace that I produced, and I was off in the corner. If you watch the making of Grace, you see shots of me in the corner on my laptop, like feverishly typing away. And so I wrote Frozen, and um, my own agent at the time was like, well, this will never work. It's three people in a chair. I'm like, I know, right? <laughs> and he's like, no. So then there were like four different companies that wanted it, and one of them, I've never told this one before, I don't think, um, wanted to make it for like a 
the budget for that movie was three million. Um, one of them was willing to make it for six million, but I had to cast almost exclusively from shows on the WB, um, which that was the first no. But the real, the biggest thing though was the head of the studio. I'm not supposed to say this stuff. Um, said he goes, uh, okay, so you're having a meeting. And this is when they're supposed to be selling themselves, when they know other places are bidding on your script, like why you should go with them. And he says, uh, okay, page turn. And he starts doing a page turn of the script. He's like, it's a film about wolves. You need to introduce the wolves right away. I'm like, it's not about wolves. <laughs> okay, and then he goes, what's a Sarlacc pit? And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> He's like, what is it? I'm like, it's Return of the Jedi, dude the big vagina and like Sam. <laughs> and he's like, never seen it. I'm like, never I can't make a movie with someone who's never seen Return of the Jedi. Um, so I went with the company that was gonna do it for three million, um, which also, uh, a bigger boat, Peter Block's company, Peter had just left Lionsgate, and I'd always rather be the flagship film and something that's very important to the studio, like it was important that the movie turned out well and did well, as opposed to being one of like, 50 movies that they may or may not even make. So that was how it all came together. But it all goes back to high school, sitting on that chair and wondering, do they know I'm here? Um, another funny story about it, speaking of that, the tagline on the poster was, no one knows you're up there. And uh, Anchor Bay wound up putting the movie out. And Anchor Bay doesn't, or didn't, they're no longer around, but they didn't market their films. They would just sort of throw them out there. And they used Sundance as the promotion for the film, and then it was released in theaters a week later, and nobody knew it was in theaters. So the fact that the poster said, no one knows you're up there, no one knew the movie was out there. <laughs> <laughs> but once it came out on home video, it, was, uh, it did extremely well, and very, very grateful for that. Well, the franchise that I would say has just become synonymous with, so I'm, I'm an 80s, so the slasher genre was very much prominent growing up, and then it seems like it took a kind of a dive down there in the early 90s, and then resurfaced with Scream in the mid-90s, and it has been pretty prominent throughout the 2000s. But one of the best slashers, unquestionably, uh, some of the best kills, unquestionably, exist in that swamp with uh, Mr. Victor Crawley, man, like that. Jesus, like, right? Um, the, uh, the work that you've done, and we'll talk about the, the whole Hatcher franchise for sure, but the work that you have produced, uh, really it seems like your buddy Joe has been on the way with you for a lot of it. You guys got a podcast together. Um, I know from experience getting to do this job, with my best friends unquestionably makes it so much more better. So having a friend like that who has similar interests as you, who's along the ride with you, ride or die, whatever, it's gotta make the whole journey that much sweeter for you too. Yeah, um, if someone could ask like, what do you wanna do when you grow up? It would have always been make movies with my friends and make the type of things that I wanna see. And so to, in that regard, like I did it and I'm so grateful for every day that I have that I've gotten to do this stuff and it really is all because of, of Hatchet and you guys supporting it the way that you did because again, it was never marketed, nobody knew when it came out and then just word of mouth among horror fans and now to be able to walk into like Walmart or Target and see the action figure, there's three action figures now and that was the first moment, almost 20 years later, when I finally felt like it worked. But once you have an action figure, I mean, I'm such a nerd, so of course that's what I cared about. But um, that was the moment when it all felt real. But I've always worked with my friends. I've always cast movies. It's almost like when actors come in, it's like you're auditioning to go on a date, almost even like something on a date. That sounds super creepy and casting couchy. That's not what I mean. Um, but you're just like, do I want to hang out with this person? And, um, and then thankfully my stuff has been successful enough that producers have never challenged that. So especially the later Hatchet movies, all those parts for the most part were always written for the actor who winds up playing the part. Um, 
and th I think that's just made it better because everybody who's there loves it. They really want to be there. They love the genre. They love the fans, um, and it's just. It, I mean, we're talking about really small budgets. The movies look a lot bigger than they are, and that's all thanks to favors and friends. The fourth patch of this is another thing you're never supposed to talk about. This, fuck it, <laughs> it's a strike, right? Um, so the fourth patch of movie, my whole thing was if we're gonna do a fourth one, it's gotta be a secret, and no one can know that we're doing it, and then we're just gonna surprise everybody. And the fact that that worked was unbelievable. Um, but uh, we only had 400 grand for that movie, which I know if you're an indie filmmaker, that might sound like a lot. But the first hatchet was shot in 2005, it was 1.5 million. The second one was 2010, and it was half that budget, because now streaming was becoming a thing. And streaming, as most of you guys know, has like majorly hurt the indie industry. The third one was 650, but shot Louisiana with a tax incentive that pushed it a little over 800. And then the fourth one was 400 grand in 11 days. That's all we have, 11 days, with a plane crash and all those effects and everything. And I still, to this day, I don't know how we did it. I don't really remember a lot of it. I just, my heart was in my throat. But I was like, at least nobody's expecting it, so if it sucks, it won't be that disappointing. Um, and then the whole plan was on the 10th anniversary of Hatchet. We would hold a free 10th anniversary screening at the Arclight and then surprise everybody by showing a new movie. And somehow, everyone on the cast, everyone on the cast, the crew, they all kept their mouths shut for almost two years waiting for the movie to be finished. There was one horror website that found out early mm -hmm. because we had to cast a couple parts. So SAG posted that I was shooting something and I always have fake titles for my stuff. So the movie was called Arwen's Fancy Dinner. <laughs> Which is funny because then every actor you've ever met starts calling. They're all, I mean, look, they're doing, they have to. They're desperate to work. And they're like, oh my God, your movie sounds so good. I'm like, does it? <laughs> my dog is Arwen. I'm like, Arwen's fancy dinner. They're like, like, I would be so good for this. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, so one horror site did find out and basically sent me an email like threatening, like, I know and they were gonna like spill the beans like a year and a half in advance. And the way that the, we got the cast and the crew to stay quiet was I was like, look, this isn't um, Star Wars or Harry Potter. It's not even like Scream or Halloween or anything, it's Hatchet. But here's some letters from soldiers who have written, who this got them through what they were going through overseas. Here's letters from burn victims that came needs in the hospitals. Here, like these are the people we're doing this for, and this surprise is gonna mean everything to them. So why would you take that away from them just to be the cool guy who gets to say, yeah. you know, that wasn't gonna work with this horror site. But Lynch was like, just write a really long, flowery letter that no one can read, like your blog. Um, <laughs> if anyone remembers when I had a blog, it was unreadable. It was, every entry was so long, it's just like, shut up, dude, just get to the point. This is what I eat for dinner. My dog's fancy dinner. Um, so, uh, he's like, but then they'll know that you're gonna publish it and out them for what they took away from the fans. And it worked. The guy immediately wrote back, oh, no, 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 I was never gonna say anything, I just wanted to let you know I'm here to help, because I need your help, dude. Um, and that's how we kept it quiet. But that was all Joe Lynch who came up with that plan. And uh, anyway, yeah, so that night, if you have the Blu-ray, you can watch it as it happened. But uh, the original cast came and did the carpet and everything. They knew we weren't really gonna watch the first movie, but they kept their mouths shut. And then when I finally said, we're gonna watch a new Hatchet movie, and then we just showed it. And that crowd, it was, uh, it was unbelievable that it worked. And that night we were trending fifth in the world. Uh, above Marvel's big Stan Lee celebration, mm -hmm. which was happening literally on the next block. So um, it was just cool to see a little movie do that and like how loud fans can be when, they're, when they appreciate something. So it was definitely worth it, but fuck was that hard, hard to make, really hard to make. Um, so if, if you've ever watched the making of any of my stuff, we're always fucking with people and we're playing practical jokes and stuff, Kane especially. And on the fourth one, 
there was a train that would go by somewhere in the area. We were shooting kind of where we shot the first one in Santa Clarita, California. And there was a train that would go by at like 2 a.m. somewhere in the distance. And you would just hear the squealing brakes. It was really eerie in the middle of the night to hear it. And I started a rumor that there, were a, there was a group of kids years ago that got hit by that train. And when you hear the squealing, if you listen, you can hear them screaming, Mom, Mommy, Daddy. And that crew got so scared so fast. <laughs> and then Austin, my assistant, was walking around with a camera, and people were like, I, hear, I heard it. Did you hear it? I totally heard it. And then people were like, no, I know that story. I knew the kids. I knew it how fast. <laughs> and, and none of it was real. But every night when the, when the train would start coming, and you'd see people scared, and Kane and I were just laughing. And, and this is, anyway. Um, it's never safe for anyone on one of my set. I mean, it's, it's safe for like, you know, stunts and things like that. But as far as getting messed with, like we're always messing with people. Although they messed with me on Frozen and it ended up being real. Where the last night of shooting, Kane came up to me. He's like, you know, you're more messed up than I thought. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, you didn't know? I'm like, didn't know what? He's like, that a dude killed himself right where you decided to shoot this? And I'm like, shut up. And he's like, no, I swear to God. So the story was a guy who worked at the mountain climbed up the pole out onto the chair and had shot himself. Now, go back in time like five months. We're scouting in Park City, Utah, because we couldn't really shoot it in New England because you, the, the snow might melt by February, like you don't know. And every ski mountain we would scout, it just didn't look like it was high enough. It looked like you might be able to make it if you had to jump. But then this one mountain, Snow Basin in Eden, you come over these trees and it's like a 50 foot drop. There's no way you could do it. And instead of saying, we should shoot here, you guys, I said, this is where they die. And then the chair stopped. And it was Will Barrett, the director of photography, and myself, and a representative from the mountain. And I'm like, you, you did that. You signaled somebody with your walkie. And she's like, terrified. She's like, no, no, I didn't, I didn't. I'm like, well, why did it stop? It took forever to get it to start again, but I was like, this is how we know where to shoot this movie. So now cut to the end of shooting, and Kane's like, you didn't know that a dude killed himself there? And then Will's like, you said this is where they die. And I'm like, no, I didn't. Um, anyway, when the movie premiered at Sundance, I told this story, still thinking they're messing with me, and a woman in the audience stood up. I don't remember the name, I'm sorry, but she was like, the guy's name was so-and-so, he was my neighbor, he climbed, and they showed me the bullet hole in the chair. Oh my God. So, of course, after that point, I'm calling the editor, I'm like, go through the footage, go through the audio, see if you hear anything. Do you see anything weird? Because there was nothing there. Which is, <laughs> but, like, what a great button of the story that would be. To be like, I mean, still, somebody died, and obviously, like, I'm not making fun of that, but, like, but I thought they were messing with me at that point. Yeah. One time, this is on the Hatchet 2 Blu-ray, the stunt guy was like, hey, have you ever, there was so much wire work in Hatchet 2 where the actors had to be flown in wires like the double chainsaw kill, which was super complicated. That chainsaw, Victor Crowley's chainsaw weighs 125 pounds. It's a real redwood chainsaw. So we show it in the first movie because I knew I was going to kill two people with it um, <laughs> by sawing them in the nuts um, in the second one. And uh, anyway. What was the point of this? Oh. <laughs> so the stunt guys come over to me right before lunch, and they're like, hey, have you ever been in wires? And I'm like, no. They're like, why don't you get in this? And everyone's starting to gather with their phones filming, and I'm like, you're going to bring me up to the ceiling and leave me there for lunch. And they're like, no, we're not. Yeah. I'll do it after lunch. Anyway, that's what they were going to do. But it's so stupid that they let everybody start filming. Of course I knew they were going to do it. What was the question? <laughs> Um, I don't even remember. The, uh, I'm just so happy to be here. You guys <laughs> but they're definitely insane that the gore factor is surpasses the Evil Dead, which is often talked about as like the ultimate gore factor movie. It was all over the marketing of Evil Dead Rise, like. Evil Dead, the musical, it's all, like, Evil Dead equals gore, like, unquestioned. But when you watch Hatchet, <laughs> like, especially Hatchet 2, like, in Hatchet 1, it's, it definitely still has, like, a creep factor of this dude's story is creepy as hell, you're out in the swamp, which is creepy as hell, and the kills 
are the suspense factor is like very comparable to like Freddy the 13th theme. And then we go to Hatchet 2, and he's just fucking ripping people apart left and right. And like you said, the double chainsaw kill. I mean, I don't know what the uh, gallon count of blood that is used from Hatchet 2 to Victor Crawley, but it's gotta be. It was like three times the amount. I used to know the exact gallon count, because Robert Pettigraff, the effects artist, geeks out on that and I'd be like, uh, at this point in the shoot, we've used 145 gallons of blood. I'm like, oh, dude, I just want to make my day. Like, okay, but just know, if, if you use 10 more, that'll be more than this movie, this movie, this movie. I'm like, I don't fucking care, dude. Um, but, yeah, so 2 was as violent as it was. 2's, two's was, well, let's see, 2 was always my favorite, but 4 is now getting there. I just think 4 is my writing was the best by, by four out of the four films. I think the characters in four, I just love them. It's, it's the funniest of the movies. Um, unfortunately, it was the lowest budget. But um, for those who don't know the story, when Hatchet 1 came out, the MPAA was still king of the box office. And they don't like it when an independent movie gets a theatrical release. There's a documentary called This Film Has Not Yet Been Rated that Kirby Dick did. I highly recommend you watch it because it'll things will make so much more sense to you, why some things get censored and why others don't. And um, so Hatchet One did festivals for 18 months. And that's the other thing a lot of people, no one wanted it. Like the first night it premiered at Tribeca, God, almost like 17 years ago, like this month or something like that. And we had no offers. Not, everyone's like, it, it won't work because it's, it's funny and it's so violent. It's gotta be one or the other, horror comedy doesn't work. Of course, we can all name a million horror comedies that we love, but they, they tend to not work because they're hard to market. And, um, and we knew we were going to be up against that from the get-go. If you remember the trailer for Hatchet, there was, it didn't wink, there was no comedy in the trailer at all. So some people were very put off by the movie when it first came out because they're like, why the fuck is this funny? Like, I thought it was supposed to be so scary. Because I know some people just hate to laugh, right? <laughs> um, so uh, the movie ends up getting a theatrical release and then suddenly the ratings board swoops in and they just cut it to shit. Uh, I, I don't remember the exact amount of times I went back and forth. It was like 16 or 17 times. And by the time the movie came out in theaters, it wasn't the movie we made. Did anyone see Hatcher One in theaters when it first came out? If no one knows it's up there. Oh, you, thank you. Um, but it wasn't. It, like everything was cut out of it and people were kind of let down because they've been hearing about this movie for a year and a half and it's winning awards and everyone's saying how gory it is and then it wasn't like that so when hatchet 2 came out i'm like i just want to go straight to video so that i don't need to deal with that and dark sky was like cool so i went like balls to the wall so violent and then all of a sudden they're like so how do you feel about us putting this in theaters i'm like no no and they're like no no, no it's okay because there's a dude at AMC theaters who's a huge Hatchet fan. I guess he was in a picture wearing a Hatchet Army shirt or something. And they worked out a deal through AMC Independent that they were going to put Hatchet 2 in major multiplexes without a rating. First time since Romero's Dawn of the Dead that a horror movie would be unrated in theaters. And I was like, holy shit, this could work. And so the movie, oh, okay. So. That was the selling point. If you've ever seen the trailer for Hatchet 2, that's the whole trailer. It's like all text that's like gore, like you've never seen before. Buckets and buckets of blood. I'm not gonna do it. And, um, and then all of a sudden, the week of release, the publicist for the distributor calls and the publicist for AMC, and they're like, stop talking about the movie being unrated. Don't mention it anymore. And I'm like, well, that's the trailer you guys made. That's the selling point. They're like, stop, no more. It, it, like there's trouble brewing, whatever that meant. And then Entertainment Weekly ran a story and their interview with me. Now, sometimes they do interviews like a month in advance and they bank it and then they release it when the movie's coming out. And it was a picture of me with duct tape over my mouth and the cover said, Adam Green says the MPAA is evil. And it's all about how the movie's getting put out unrated and I'm getting my revenge. So for those who remember this, Hatchet 2 opened on a Friday and it was gone by Saturday. 
They pulled it from every theater. And no one said why. AMC wouldn't say anything. There was one guy who was like an affiliate with the company. He was like, it's because the per screen average was not good. There was a movie that opened that weekend called Chain Letter that made $32 per screen. Don't tell me our per screen average wasn't good. And, um, and that was it, it was gone. And then I feel like I finally got my revenge when Damien put Terrifier 2 in theaters unrated. We were just too early, but 12 years later, look how it works. Because there is an audience who doesn't want their horror movies fucked with. So um, I'm so excited to see what happened with Terrifier 2. Now we're getting a third one, so if they keep going, maybe someday Victor Kali can beat up that fucking clown. Yeah. <laughs> and that'd be a hell of a fight. Art find his way to the swamp on the night that Victor Crowley died. He's a full power. Like... Who knows? Who knows? But I'm so proud of what they've done with those movies, and it's so great to see an unrated horror movie do well because um, it was given a chance. You mentioned number two being what was your favorite, and there was a, a huge shift which became a staple of the franchise as much as Kane became a staple of the franchise. Hatchet 2, you know, we, we see the transition of Mary Beth and the introduction of Danielle Harris playing her. And I was like, when I was watching it the other night, I was like, damn, this is really kind of like the beginning of badass Danielle Harris. Like, she now, I mean, she's got a podcast of her own with, uh, Scout Taylor Compton, and you know she's very active on social media, but she very much is like the badass horror female icon of our generation now. Like she's reached that level in the fandom, and it kind of started with Hatchet too. Like she comes in, and you immediately like there's no there was no problem as far as it you know, being a different actress. Like, she looks so comfortable in the role. And she's telling people F off, like, immediately with, like, no hesitation. Like, what was that like, you know, having her come on board? Okay, so, this, <laughs> so Danielle auditioned for Hatchet One. And the only reason I didn't cast her was because I already had Kane Hodder, Robert Inglis, Tony Todd, Mercedes McDab, Josh Leonard, I was so nervous that everyone was going to think it's like a parody movie because there's so many horror stars in it. So I went with the unknown actress, Tamara Feldman, who was fantastic in the movie. Unfortunately, when we went to make the sequel, she took some, some bad advice from agents who thought, given the success of the first one, this was going to be some huge payday for her. And um, it's just sad. But then I had to call Danielle because I'm like, do I change the whole story? Because it was a trilogy from Jump that was always planned out. Um, the only people who knew what was gonna happen were Pentagraph, the effects artist, John Beekler, who was the key effects artist, and also Jack Cracker. Um, because I had to explain to them that Victor Crowley is half black when we made the first one, because his hair. Um, and so they knew, but the rest of the crew, nobody knew his actual backstory yet. It's, I'm just such a, the more I say this, the more I realize what a loser I am. Like, I had this shit so planned out. Like, we might have never even gotten to make a second one. Um, anyway, uh, and so I went with Tamara. That wasn't going to work out. And I'm like, if I'm going to continue this, I have to trade up now. I have to deliver to the fans an actress that they're going to... Because at first, everyone's going to bitch and go, oh, they're recasting the main actress. But then you say Daniel Harris, and they're like, fuck yeah. So I called Danielle and I explain everything that's going on, and she's silent. We've been friends for a long time. And then she, all she said was, admit you were wrong. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. Well, you understand why she's like, admit you were wrong. When the guy was wrong, she's like, yeah, I'll do it. And, um, and then to watch her just be such a badass, um, and to see the way that um, the, uh, the gay and lesbian community embraced that character, because to have a female heroine, final girl, uh, who's gay, was also really big. And I purposely, we never shine a light on that, we don't make it a thing, it just is. Mm -hmm. But when we made Hatchet 3, and I mentioned that, because there was a line about it, and I'm like, I don't like that line, like, we don't, it's not, there's no reason to make it a thing. And Danielle goes, I'm sorry, wait, Mary Beth's gay? And I'm like, yeah, we had a whole conversation. She's like, did we? I'm like, Oh no, Tamara and I had that conversation. <laughs> Sorry, oh, no. I forgot I never had the conversation with her. Um, 
But yeah, what that character's meant to people is great. And I had to keep her out of the fourth one um, so that it wouldn't become repetitive. Because I had, as you'll see eventually, the way Victor Crowley comes back in the fourth one, the rules had to change so I can get him out of the swamp finally. So the way he was brought back with the curse, now he's free to get out of the swamp. And um, to do those screenings, because we did a whole tour with that movie. Did anyone see it on the tour? I can't remember if we came up to San Francisco. We did? Okay. And um, the scene hidden in the credits, when we reveal that Mary Beth is still alive, and Daniel picks up that shotgun, and she's like, I've been waiting for you, motherfucker. And the crowd would just go fucking nuts. And she's like, now I get why you kept me out of it. So eventually, if there are more, or when, or whatever. I'm, I promise I'm not gonna do a secret thing again and surprise, like that's never gonna work again. It's just not on the, on the table at this very moment. But um, to see her come back and the way things are gonna change and stuff, but it's hard when you're doing sequels, man, because people wanna feel like they did when they saw the first one. But we change, we grow up, we get older, It's we're different. So you can't just keep making the same movie over and over again, you gotta change it a little bit. Like the third one was super action-packed with all the gunfire and the explosions, um, but by doing it and kind of re-jump-starting it with the fourth one, still the same story, but at least I got out of that one weekend. It's now 10 years later. Also, does everyone know that I Survivor from the book that Perry Shen is promoting, that that's a real book, you can read the book, and it explains what you didn't see between three and four, it sets up what might be coming. So many people bought the book because they're like, it's a prop from the movie. It's, no, it's a real, read it. And I've said this to some of you that I've met at my table this weekend, but I signed so many copies of that book and I'm always like, what did you think? And everyone's always like, I didn't read it. I'm like, why? Like, ah. I don't really like reading. I'm like, god damn it. There's an audio version. Like, ah. I wrote that book twice because I didn't think it was good enough the first time. Um, and Joan Edder co-wrote it with me as well. Anyway. Um, but yeah, a lot of thought goes into these little slasher movies. Too much, too much thought goes into it, probably. Um, right now, if you have a question for Adam, raise Please. your hand, and John will come up to you with the microphone. Does anybody have? Definitely ask questions, because I'll just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> You're one of the only people that ever say that. Everyone's always like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah, um, my question is, and the movie Frozen, did you get any flack from uh, Disney? Um, my Frozen came out four years before Disney's, so they got flack from me. They didn't care um, or return my calls, but I was very angry. Um, so no, you can't own a word. Um, there's lots of movies called Frozen, so we weren't the first necessarily. I don't know of the other ones, but I, I know we weren't. So, um, if anything, it helped, because so many parents who don't pay attention to what their kids are watching, <laughs> there you go, and then their kids are like, what the fuck? I wanted to build a snowman. This dude just got eaten by wolves. Like, that's what you get for being a bad parent. I'm just so happy to see people. <laughs> I've been like hiding in my office ever since COVID hit. And so, Anyway, yeah, it's just great to see you guys. I'm so happy to be here. I know I keep saying that, but I really Go ahead. Oh, yes. All right. Uh, I know you probably would get asked this question a lot, but who do you think will win in a fight, Jason or Hatchet? Okay. Uh, who would win in a fight, Jason or Victor Crowley? I'm going to go with Kane's answer to this, which is Jason would get his ass kicked by Victor Crowley. <laughs> But he would. See, the problem is Vic, it's not fair, because Victor Crowley is a repeating ghost, so it doesn't matter what you do to him. He's, but he's got more rage. He doesn't really need, even need weapons. A lot of what he does is with his bare hands. Um, so, and he's fast, and he's switchy, and he's nervous. So, but I would love to see that fight. I don't think uh, the rights will ever line up, because Hatchet is here. It's a little bigger of a known property, so. I don't think it'll happen, but that would be great to, to see, especially if Kane was playing both, because it'd be great to see Kane in that hockey mask again. The look he got with Derek coming aboard, with, with uh, him, uh, which would, he was pretty entertaining, by the way. With, but Have you guys met Derek Mears? Has he been here before? He's the nicest 
human being alive, but he plays such like terrifying characters, and in Hatchet Three he plays such an asshole, and like he's okay. I just was telling my parents' manager this story. So the Aeroscope Studio, uh, it's an old ironworks facility that we moved into in 2010. There was no air conditioning for the first 10 years we were in this place. So you're in the valley in the summertime. It would get over like 118 degrees, no windows, and like misery. And then Derek, when he got Swamp Thing, which is like a really big, big show, put in restaurant quality air conditioning into the Aeroscope Studio because he couldn't stand watching us suffer like that. It changed my life, and I'm sure he'd be so mad that I'm telling this story right now because it's just so like, I don't know. But that's who Derek Mears is. He's such a good friend, he's such a good person. Um, but with Victor Crowley, I've loved picking off all the people who have played horror icons. So at this point, because we finally got a Michael Myers in the last one with killing Tyler Maine in the first five minutes. Spoiler, sorry. Um, <laughs> But uh, at this point, he's killed all of them. Like, literally all of them. And the fact, Sid Haig in the third one, that scene, which Sid Haig's house was built in my office, by the way. And if you look closely, if you know the show Holliston, everything in Sid Haig's house is from Adam and Joe's apartment. Because we were shooting season two of Holliston when we shot that scene. Also, the ambulance boat, which is like the whole third act of Hatchet 3, that was in the courtyard of my office. Um, the crew, man, they're so creative with the things they build and what they do, and uh, none of my movies would be nearly as good without the people who I have around me. Man. They're just, uh, I'm so lucky, I'm so lucky. What was the question? <laughs> How did I get to that? Air conditioning, how did I tell you? Who asked me about air conditioning? Nobody. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? I'm not high either, I swear. <laughs> I'm an old monster kid, so I'm a, a child of the 50s and 60s. And I have to tell you, I had the biggest crush on your mom. And do you know how to take that? Um, <laughs> you know what's funny is... Wait, I don't get it. <laughs> wasn't your mom Phyllis Newman? Or am I mixing it up? My mom? Yeah. No. My mom's okay. Dale Green. Okay, well, that's just the most embarrassing moment of my life. She's going to love this story. My mom. I, my mom was so cheap growing up. Here we go. My mom was so cheap growing up that if I wanted the box of breakfast cereal that wasn't on sale but it had the cool toy in it, it would count as my birthday present oh my for the God. next year. And she fucking remembered. Right? And so my birthday would be coming up, and I'd be like, oh man, Bad Alarm or He Man or whatever. And she'd be like, how are those honey smacks? God damn it. And then I'd be like, I should have gotten those generic frosted flakies. They're adequate. <laughs> well, I just stand up, and I did stand up. I used to close with that. I was I just went from adorable to creepy in about two seconds. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. My mom is hot, I guess. <laughs> I, I call her it. <laughs> yeah, I, I was thinking... That is the funniest thing that's ever happened. <laughs> I was just thinking that like a few years ago, Steve Dash hit on my mom in this room. He was at the table, hit on my mom as she asked a question. Charlie just hit on your mom, so we've come full circle. Is this have to end? Is there a time limit? Is, there... <laughs> is Holliston season three still on the table? Um, so unfortunately, no, no, it's not. Um, it doesn't mean it could never happen, but, I was, sorry, the question was, uh, is there ever gonna be a third season of Holliston? So, um, part of our deal with the network was if we got to a third season, the budget had to double. So we would get to do 20 episodes instead of just 10 a season. So, um, the third season was greenlit, because the show was doing really well. And then, unfortunately, as most of you know, Dave Rocky, who was odorous, passed away suddenly. And then, it was like eight days later, uh, Time Warner and Comcast did a merger and got rid of Fearnet. So, we lost one of our stars, we lost our network, and then incidentally, like three days after that, my wife left me too. Like, it was a dark fucking time. And, um, yeah, so, 
everything just, it sucks too, because Holliston took 13 years to get made. That was the thing I moved out here to do. Uh, my first movie was called Coffee and Donuts. You can only see it if it's like a surprise screening, where like, we did a screening of like Frozen at the New Beverly in LA, and then I like, surprised everyone by showing Coffee and Donuts afterwards. The reason why we can't release Coffee and Donuts is because of all the copyright infringement. No idea what I was doing. We made the movie for $400 in 1998. Um, and it, it act, has anyone seen it when we've shown it on like a live stream or something like that? It's, um, it actually holds up, surprisingly. And it was edited tape to tape, which means once you made an edit, you could never go back and change it again because you're editing in order. Um, but it ended up becoming policy. So when I made Coffee and Donuts, I got signed by an agent, and then I sold it as a sitcom to UPN. Anyone remember UPN? And you know what's funny is you know who I said I wanted to be the leads in? It was still called Coffee and Donuts. This is 2003. I said I wanted Kevin Hart and Zach Galifianakis, and they <laughs> laughed at me. Yeah, so they never know. Um, anyway, uh, so it was devastating when, it, when all that happened. And then when it moved over to Shudder, it was doing so well there, and like just social media was crazy. So we were like, maybe they're gonna do it. Yeah. And they, no. not yet, so I, I don't know. And the thing is, Austin, um, I, again, I know this is gonna sound like a lot, but it's not, we did each, season, a season for 800 grand. The average network sitcom is like seven million an episode. So um, it's unheard of what we did, but there's never been an independent sitcom before. So no one knows what to do with it. Um, people are like, well, just crowdfund it. I just, I don't have much faith in crowdfunding. I know it can work sometimes, but it's, I don't know. And it also can ruin your life. Has anyone ever done it? Try to make something through crowdfunding? You get that one asshole who donates like five bucks and then makes your life miserable for years. Where's my free thing? Where's my thing? Like, it's, we're making it. Oof. Um, yeah, so we don't want to do that. But maybe someday, I mean, we'll be older and a little heavier, but we'll, we're still funny. I think we're, I think we're still funny. Hopefully we're still funny. Um, my favorite, one of my favorite lines in that show, Lance Rocket, Dee Snyder's character, who's just so delusional thinking he's gonna make it in the Van Halen tribute band. And at one point he turns to us and he says, I'm only 23 years old. <laughs> <laughs> um, that show was the best time of my life. I, uh, for everyone who worked on it, nothing will ever be, you just go to work every day and just laugh and laugh and laugh. And you're working with all your closest friends. And um, even you know, the only reason we don't have a studio audience the whole time is because in order to do it on the budget we do it, we shoot it, we block shoot it like a feature. So for the season, we shoot all the apartment scenes over like, whatever, two weeks. Then that set gets torn down and then the cable station goes up and we shoot all those things. So if you're someone in the audience, you have no idea what's going on while you're watching the show. I'll go out and try to explain it, but we have like a very small audience of like friends and friends and crew and stuff, just so we have a laugh track to perform and pace the jokes to. And then like every other show, we fill that in with the studio laugh track. Now with season one, we tried to make a joke out of the laugh track by purposely reusing the same laughs over and over again. I think it works for a little bit. Also, the other joke that a lot of people don't notice, um, the opening credits of Holliston, there's a random old man who comes out who's standing with us. Because, you know, sitcoms always, they're so cheesy with the cast all standing there, like, back to back, like. <laughs> so to make fun of that, we had somebody with us who's not on the show, just to see how long it took fans to figure that out. Four weeks it took. So when the, the night after the Candyman episode aired, that's the first time we started seeing on Twitter, who's the old guy? <laughs> so in season two, he's not there in the credits. But the network did not want me to do that joke. They're like, who is that? I'm like, it doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. He's just there. They're like, this is so stupid. I'm like, I know, it's great. Well, we have unfortunately reached the end of our time. But Who's next? Can I train with them? Competition. Oh. oh, yeah. They worked really hard on those costumes. So I'll shut up for that. But he will, Adam will be at his table all weekend. So please make sure you go say hi to him. 
talk to him. He's got a bunch of really cool stuff at his table, like screenplays and all kinds of cool posters from his filmography. Pictures of my mom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, God, I'm so happy the video camera was on. Real look, guys, thank you so much. If you've ever watched my stuff, um, thank you. I'm nothing without you. I've never had marketing or any of those things. It's always just been you and your positive word of mouth and your energy and your love. And I appreciate it so fucking much. So thank you. And I'm so, again, I'm so happy to be here and see everybody. Thank you.